you know, we've talked for a while about the flipping of the culture, but he's established a, a, a way of practicing and preparing and building. And it's really, really impressive. They, they play hard for that guy. Yeah. But, you know, I also think, you know, it's, they play hard for each other. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think, and it's, what's cool about the whole thing is, you know, it really has happened organically. You know, the, one of the things I was thinking about is so many coaches, you know, the urban Meyer, like he's, he was a textbook kick everybody out of the locker room. They got to earn their right way back in the locker room and just demanding um, all this stuff. It always struck me as odd. A new coach comes in. It's so phony. It works, but it's forced. I mean, like the players don't have any choice. If they want to play college football, they have to go away. They have to go along with whatever this guy is, is ordering. This has been completely different. You know, Mike Norvell, and I think he's said this recently, like he's never asked them to trust him. Like he just came in and said, I'm going to keep working. And I'm going to do everything I can to make you guys better. And I'm going to help you and put things in place for you guys to have success. And that has developed that trust, but he didn't demand it. He didn't even ask for it. And I think because it's happened organically, I think that's why it's so cool. And I, you know, I heard you talk about it a little bit in the first hour and Corey wrote it about it after the game. Like it's fun to watch this football team play. And I think a lot of it's because it is organic. It, it wasn't forced by a head coach. Yeah, and you know, in many ways, I wonder if that's because, and and he has said this before at a coaches convention uh, speech I listened to when we first hired Mike Norvell, where he talked about you know kind of being raised by football. I, you know, he he gives credit mm-hmm. obviously to his mom, but the the male figures in his life were football coaches, and you know, I I think that has to come across as incredibly genuine to a lot of guys on this team, right? Like that that the the relatability factor to putting it all on the line and getting better every day and going to work and doing something like having a process to fall back on. Like he's done all of that himself. So when he does it or illustrates it and, and, and talks about it, it, it's probably very, very comes across as very, very genuine to them. And how, how rewarding must it be for him and, and really the whole staff when they see the players doing some of the things they do in terms of watching how they interact on the sideline, you know, today in the press conference, I think John Papuch has mentioned, you know, when you go down to a team meal, guys are sitting in their seats 15 minutes early. Um, just the way they interact when, when the, when the defense is on the field or, or when the backups are on the field in the fourth quarter and the, you know, you see the starters not just sitting on the bench talking or whatever. They're like standing on the sideline watching, mm-hmm. laughing with each other. Um, I mean, it's got to be incredibly rewarding. But I, what I do think is an interesting spot right now is, you know, it's not like they're, you know, on the top of the mountaintop, obviously, you know, there's still a team that's you know barely in the top 20 and it's a team that, uh, you know, does have three losses this year and nobody's saying this team is, 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 you know, arrived, but at the same time, you know, you, you want to appreciate how far it's come. It's got to be cool to watch this, uh, when they put so much work into it at the same time, they know that they're nowhere near, uh, where they want to be as a program. Yeah, I can only imagine uh, watching, especially guys that maybe were like a tough nut to crack, you know, like somebody who wasn't so sure and had been burned. Obviously, if they'd been here for a while, they'd seen a lot of coming and going with coaches and they weren't real sure that they could trust anybody. And then you see that guy finally take the step to buy in and believe and then help lead others. You're right. And now I think it's an interesting balancing act too, Ira, to the larger point we're talking about. You have developed this culture. You have a team that's fun to watch play. They play hard for each other. They play hard for that staff. They play in a way that is absolutely enjoyable to take in as a fan. And now you've got to go about the process of trying to sustain that. And you got to do that in the era of NIL and transfer portal. Right. That's tough, man. It would have been easier the old way. And and and, and what I mean by that is when guys didn't have as many choices or money wasn't blatantly ch- exchanging hands, you know? I mean, this is going to be a hard thing to sustain. It's built the right way. He keeps talking about that, and he's right. But those players have to pass it on to the new ones that come in. Yeah, and, and the dynamics change. You know, every coach will say this. Jimbo used to say it all the time. I'm sure Norvell would say the same thing. That you know, every year, every team has a one year life expectancy, and so just because this team seems to have found that that wonderful place, doesn't mean next year's will. Um, because you're going to add in new elements. Some guys will leave. Some guys will come. Um, but I do think at this point you have to give them a lot of credit because last year they ident- or two years ago they identified the Jay Sean and Corbins, and last year it was uh, the Jermaine Johnsons and Keir Thomas, and you know along the way it was Jamie Robinson, and Fabian Lovett, and all those guys. And 
uh, you know, some of these guys we're mentioning were guys that people had question marks about how they would fit in. Would they be team guys? And they all did. So I think the track record says that they'll be able to do it. Um, but yeah, the challenges will be different, especially, you know, the stakes get higher. Uh, you, you start bringing in better players that changes some dynamics as well. Um, but man, it's good. It's good to have those problems from the, from the yeah. problems <laughs> we were watching uh, the last few years. Yeah. And I know you referenced it in the column, but I agree. It's uh, how fun is that Florida state Florida game going to be? I mean, both have a lot on the line. Both are uh, attempting to take another step forward. Uh, both are trying to wrestle control from the other when it comes to recruits and who's on the fastest path towards consistent success. So I think that game, and I know we got a game this week with Louisiana, but that game's going to be intense uh, from a physical standpoint. I think that's going to be the most physical game of the year. Well, and what's cool about it is it, I think it should be a good game. Like last year's game, I thought was a dumpster fire. You know, I mean, it was just both teams kind of stunk. Uh, Florida State's players just kind of lost their minds a little bit more than Florida's players did. And then Jordan Travis got hurt for a little bit. So Florida won the game, but neither of those teams played good at all. Um, but I think both teams have kind of come a long way and they've got better, you know, um, things in place now from a coaching staff standpoint. And one more thing I wanted to touch on, you know, with the, the big picture stuff and why this is so much fun is, you know, college football has gotten to be very transactional, um, you know, where you've got the, between the NIL, but then also thinking about like the bowl games and guys who don't play in bowl games anymore because they, you know, it's just, that's not what they're in their best interest. I'm curious to see like this team, it's their first bowl game in, you know, four years. And it's a, it's a chance, it, you know, this team, these guys have kind of put this program on the map and I'm not saying that they should be required to want to play in the bowl game. If they're, if they're guys who are going to the NFL, but I'm curious to see how, if that decision is, is more difficult on this team and this year, because this team doesn't feel transactional. So much of college football has become transactional. And this team doesn't feel that way. And I think that's going to be something to, to watch uh, going to the bowl season. I heard you talking about the bowls uh, in, in, in the earlier hours. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, this question that we got in the chat kind of fits along that narrative. So well, you and I can attempt to answer this. Uh, I, I want to hear your opinion. I've got one, obviously, as well. Tom writes, in the beginning of the Jimbo regime, I believed in him like I do Norvell now. Did Jimbo change or were we fooled? I'll always appreciate the national title, but was love, trust, and believe in each other just a lie? Uh, I do think he changed for a lot of reasons. Yeah. And and in most of those, uh, to answer your question, Tom, most of those have to do with off-the-field stuff. Um, yeah, he ended up losing the locker room, but I think he lost the locker room because his personal life was in shambles. In the personal life, but then also just his, his own letting – personal beefs become the yes. focal point mm -hmm. inside the athletic department and, mm -hmm. and you know and, and all of that as well and and you know he got resentful and you know it just became a toxic situation but you know i think he got you know i'm not going to get in the i can't get into jimbo's mind but i think he thought he's got as long as he's got great players as long as he's calling plays that he could not ne necessarily have to focus as much on the other stuff anymore because the program was in place well that's, that's not how it works man you, you know, you right. have to stay on top of guys. You're bringing in new players all the time. And once they sense that you're not focused and that you're not dialed in, you're not paying attention to what they're doing, man, you're, you're in trouble. And I think that happened and it just started to spiral out of control. The personal stuff off the field obviously was, you know, kerosene. Yeah, I think so. I think it, it lent itself to uh, that really blowing up in his face. And I also think the other problem there and final thing on this, I, I if it, you're if you're winning football games because you've recruited really talented players, but you don't hold them to certain standards that you set in place prior to their arrival, and you ignore it because that person's really good. You you only get to do that once, and have everybody in that locker room look over and realize that you're not about it, that you're a liar, that that those that the foundation that you talk about is really nothing. Those are just words because you've you've contradicted yourself already. The best example ever, I think, is what happened in Gainesville with Urban Meyer. You know, I mean, that was – he talked tough, um, but by the end of his time there, those players ran the asylum. And they hated and, him. <laughs> At the end, they hated him. I mean, I, I was yeah. down on the field to hear them curse him out in a game. <laughs> so, yeah, man, that's the textbook example. And it, it can work in the short term. Sure. And, you know, and like you said, Norvell will talk about how he's trying to build this for the long term. And that I think that he's never going to come out and say what he's talking about because he doesn't want to – you know, throw stones at other programs, but I think that is it. Like you can win in the short term by taking a different approach. 
uh, but it doesn't usually work in the long term. 